This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Up to the minute stock market news and in depth analysis. Our quant rating service provides objective, independent ratings daily on over 4,300 stocks. Learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Insolvent Detroit. The city becomes the largest ever to enter bankruptcy, leaving pensioners to wonder what happens next. Trucking along, automakers, symbol of Detroit's old economy, sold more cars than expected in November. But can the pace of sales continue into the new year? And falling behind, American students are lagging other nations in reading, math, and science. What changes need to be made to ensure future generations com can compete in a global economy? We have all that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Tuesday, December 3rd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tyler Matheson. Well, remember how great a month November was for stock investors? All those records, all those consecutive weeks of gains for the market barometers? Well, hold that thought because so far December has gone the other way, fast. In fact, the Dow and the S&P 500 today ended lower for a third straight session logging their biggest three-day decline in two months. Some on Wall Street say stock price is just too high, that traders are taking some profits or the markets are overdue for a pullback, and this is the start of it. Or maybe it's consumer spending, soggy so far this holiday season, or maybe it's that the Fed, seeing today's blowout auto sales numbers, among other positive data, will start paring back on stimulus soon. Whatever the reason, the market sold off again today. The Dow ending well off the lows of the session, however, Nevertheless, down 94 points and closing below 16,000, as you see there. The Nasdaq was down 8, and the S&P 500 lost 5, dipping back below the 1,800 mark. Crude oil moved sharply higher, getting a boost from solid manufacturing data out of China. It shot up to more than $96 a barrel. That's the highest price since Halloween. An historic day for the city of Detroit, birthplace of the Motown Sound and the U.S. auto industry, and now poised to become the largest bankrupt city in the nation's history. A federal judge today declared the city could proceed with its bankruptcy filing, clearing the way for sweeping changes to contracts and pension payouts to city workers and retirees, as well as potentially massive losses for the city's municipal bondholders. Scott Cohn is in Detroit. He joins us now with more on today's ruling and what could happen next in Motor City. So, stock, uh, Scott, boy, this was a landmark ruling. Tell us exactly what happened in court today and what does Chapter 9 mean for Detroit? Well, uh, Susie, it is hugely significant for Detroit, but it's also significant across the country. That's why this ruling is such a big deal, not just because it's the biggest in U.S. history, but because of the implications, not just here in Detroit, but for cities, unions, pensioners and municipal bond investors nationwide. Judge Stephen Rhodes, the U.S. bankruptcy judge who's presiding over this case, said that uh, Detroit could get through restructuring some of uh, its massive debt, saying that the path that the city is on now, piling up debt, cutting services, is not only unworkable but dangerous. He said the city needs help. So what is he telling me? Well, sorry, we're going to take your pension, we're going to make you homeless, starve you out, and send you to a soup line? We're telling Judge Rhodes to go to hell. Well, more specifically, the city's largest employee union almost immediately filed a notice of appeal, and there's talk about appealing this ruling all the way to the Supreme Court because of the potentially massive cuts in those pension benefits for some 20,000 retirees. But meantime, as that, that plays out, comes the long and hard work of restructuring the city's finances, some $18.5 billion in debt. That task of coming up with a so-called plan of adjustment falls to the state-appointed emergency manager, Kevin Orr, who says it's now time for everyone to work together. Come forward with us. Take this opportunity, even in the process of litigation and appeals, to try to get at the sorely needed reform that this city has got to achieve so we can move forward into a new day. The unions say the time for negotiating was before the bankruptcy filing, and the judge did say that Rhodes and the city did not negotiate in good faith, but nonetheless they said the filing itself was in good faith because the union refused to negotiate. Susie. 
You know, Scott, you said that this Detroit situation has implications for other cities across the country, and, and you just did that fabulous series for us on broken cities. Are we likely to see more cities following the path of Detroit? Well, they may not necessarily be filing bankruptcy. That's pretty drastic. But what it does is it, it really changes the, the dynamic now between cities and their unions. We talked about a couple weeks ago the massive pension obligations that so many cities face. They now have a path to try and clear out some of those obligations and possibly hold the threat of bankruptcy over the union's head. The dynamic has completely changed. You know, Scott, the unions have been fighting these cuts, understandably, but there's not any money to pay some of those pension benefits, and those funds have been underfunded. So where do the union members expect the money to come from when the city is broke, and what makes the union any different from a host of other creditors? Well, the union says that the state is not insolvent, and the state could be kicking in some money here. Indeed, Michigan Governor Rick Snyder said he wanted to wait to see how the bankruptcy process played out before he decided whether the state could give any aid to prop up its largest city. Now we know that, and we'll see if the state steps up. Scott Cohn, thanks very much for your reporting all day today. All right, despite the dire outlook for Detroit, the industry that spawn, that city spawned continues to be a linchpin of the economic recovery. Sales of new cars and light trucks last month rose to the highest level since February of 2007, on pace now to move nearly 16 and a half million units for the year. Big gains for Detroit's big three. General Motors saw a 14% sales increase thanks to its Tahoe and Sierra lines, along with the Chevy Impala. Ford sales up 7%, getting a boost from the Ford Fusion sedan and those F-150 pickups. And Chrysler sales rose 16% on strong sales of Dodge Ram pickups and the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Phil LeBeau joins us from Chicago with more on what drove those November sales so much higher. Phil, a lot of automakers uh, ran Black Friday promotions this year. Did they really help? Oh, huge help, Tyler. And, and it wasn't just on Black Friday. That's a big draw. But it was through the whole weekend. Almost every automaker today said, you know what? We had huge numbers this weekend. That's why we saw the strong sales. Tell us a little bit about what we can expect from the luxury car market. Of course, this is the time of year when people like to give, right. you know, those keys to the <laughs> fancy car under the Christmas tree. Sure. They all have funny names for their sales or, or unique names, I should say. And they're all pushing aggressive marketing plans right now, Susie. We saw strong sales in November. Expect that to continue through December. All right, Phil LeBeau, we have to leave it there. And there you see those luxury sales, Mercedes number one, then BMW and Lexus. Phil LeBeau, thank you. Well, President Obama trying to generate some support for the revamped rollout of the trouble-plagued healthcare.gov website, saying the site is now working well and warning critics that he will fight any efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act. This law is working and will work into the future. People want the financial stability of health insurance, and we're going to keep on working to fix whatever problems come up in any startup, any launch of a project this big that has an impact on one-sixth of our economy. Um, whatever comes up, we're going to just fix it. Well, the administration also released a new report showing that through that website, nearly one and a half million Americans have now been found eligible for Medicaid, and that was only during the month of October. Still ahead on Nightly Business Report, we'll tell you about the company that many are calling the big winner of Black Friday and Cyber Monday. numbers coming in for consumer spending over the long Thanksgiving and Black Friday weekend. ShopperTrack, a provider of retail analytics, reports that sales rose 1 percent at brick-and-mortar stores during those four days compared to so-called Black Weekend sales a year ago. And ShopperTrack says total spending over the four-day weekend topped $22 billion. But not a lot of that money was being spent on personal computers. The research firm IDC says that shipments of PCs are expected to fall by 10 percent this year. That's the biggest annual decline ever as more consumers turn to tablets and smartphones instead. Speculation over an Apple deal with China Mobile flared up again. Fortune.com showed a screen grab of a China Mobile subsidiary apparently taking pre-orders for iPhones. 
Apple's been looking to increase its market share in China. But the world's largest carrier of mobile phones denied that there's a deal with Apple yet, and the website page has been taken down. But investors liked what they heard and coupled that with a UBS upgrade. Apple shares jumped nearly 3 percent today to $566.32. That's the highest it's been since December 4th last year. Well, more good news for Apple, which appears to be shining this holiday shopping season with iPads and iPhones flying off the shelves without offering any discounts or other promotions to consumers. Josh Lipton has more on Apple's bright holiday prospects. In October, Apple's CEO Tim Cook said it was going to be an iPad Christmas. It looks like he could be right. Consumers hit the stores on Black Friday looking for new tablets, and many of them decide to buy iPads. It wasn't just adults. The National Retail Federation says that, for the first time, iPads were among the most popular gifts for children this year. The new iPad Air has received a lot of positive attention. Walter Mossberg of the Wall Street Journal called it the best tablet he has ever reviewed. Apple didn't offer discounts for its devices, but it did give $75 gift cards for the purchase of an iPad Air and a $50 gift card with an iPad Mini. Big retailers took it one step further. Best Buy cut the price of the iPad Air by $50. Apple does face competition in this space. InfoScout, a consumer research company, says Apple's iPad Mini was the top seller at Walmart on Black Friday. The iPad Air was the top seller at Target. But at Best Buy, Microsoft Surface came in first. Still, Scott Kessler of S&P Capital IQ says Apple's success on Black Friday could mean a stronger holiday season for the company. A lot of these gifts were purchased for Christmas and probably won't be opened um, for another few weeks. A lot of these products, we think, were probably bought for use now. And if that's the case, you're going to see people buying related accessories, software, content, apps, all those things are going to help boost Apple, we think, throughout the month and throughout the holiday shopping period. Apple's stock has surged higher. It's up 46 percent since its low of 388 in June. Apple had predicted revenue in the final quarter to be as much as $58 billion. After the strong showing on Black Friday, analysts at Jefferies think the quarter could now be tracking toward the high end of that forecast. A further boost to Apple's future? If reports are true about China Mobile selling Apple products, then analysts say that could mean an additional $10 billion in annual sales for the company. Josh Lipton, Nightly Business Report, Silicon Valley. J.C. Penney had happy holiday news to report to investors after the market closed today, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The struggling retailer said sales rose 10 percent compared to last November. Sales on JCP.com also were stronger. J.C. Penney stock rose in after hours. Shares were up 1 percent to $10.11 in the regular session. Groupon posted record sales this holiday weekend, with more customers logging on to score savings. The Daily Deal site reported that Black Black Friday and Cyber Monday were the two biggest sales days ever in North America since the company's founding. The good news sent the stock up almost 4 percent to $9 and change. Shares of Oncomet Pharmaceuticals scored on news of a deal with Celgene. Celgene will help Oncomet develop and market six experimental anti-cancer stem cell drugs. The deal will leave Oncomet with $155 million to study the treatments. Celgene will also take a 5 percent stake in the drug maker. Looking at the stocks, Oncomet skyrocketed, doubling its price to $27.70. Celgene shares, however, fell 2 percent. Zencore was a high flyer in his first day of trading on the Nasdaq today. The biotech company went public, raising $70 million in its IPO. The stock rose more than 51 percent to $8.34. Well, the activist investor Engaged Capital is certainly engaged in shaking things up at Abercrombie & Fitch. The firm sent a letter to the teen retailer's board urging it to replace its CEO, his contract is up this February. The letter also says selling the struggling chain may be the best option for shareholders. Abercrombie responded to the suggestion, saying it welcomes input from shareholders. 
Shares popped nearly 6% to $35.99. Well, the Oreo cookie maker Mondelez boosted its stock buyback program by $1.7 billion. That's a lot of cookies. The increase is part of the company's plan to use the proceeds from its legal dispute with Starbucks. Back in November, as you may recall, Starbucks was ordered to repay Mondelez for the early termination of a grocery store deal. The buyback announcement sends shares up more than 1% to $33.90. Potash will cut nearly 20 percent of its workforce or about a thousand jobs. The world's largest producer of potash has been struggling to keep up as demand for two key fertilizer ingredients, potash and phosphate, have slumped. The cuts will take place in Canada, the U.S. and in Trinidad. Shares were a fraction higher today to $31.79. A bad report card on American education. New test scores show that American students continue to lag in international rankings. According to results from the Program for International Student Assessment, U.S. teenagers ranked below average in math and near average in reading and science, trailing behind countries like Japan and China, where students of the same age continue to maintain top scores. Can this be fixed, and what does this mean for businesses and America's competitiveness? Here to discuss this, Michelle Rhee, former chancellor of the public schools in Washington, D.C., and currently the CEO and founder of Students First. Michelle, we're very happy to have you on our program. You're such an education expert. Let me just start with this first question of can this be fixed, because just about every CEO that Tyler and I talk to is are very worried about U.S. competitiveness and, you know, where are they going to get top talent in the workplace if our kids in school just aren't doing well? What do you think? It can absolutely be fixed. And I hear the same thing from business folks saying that they can't find people in their applicant pool who have the skills and knowledge that they need to fill mission-critical jobs. That means there's a, a misalignment um, between what we are teaching our kids in school and what the workplace requires. Um, it can absolutely be fixed by doing a few things. First, uh, we need to make sure that we have high standards for all of our children. Um, and we're putting those things in place right now through what is called the Common Core uh, Standards which will ensure that we have a set of uh, national standards that are internationally benchmarked. So that's one important thing to do. The second thing that we have to do is invest in our teaching force and make sure that we have the most highly effective uh, and the best prepared teachers. Um, that's what other countries that are topping the list uh, internationally absolutely do. And the third thing is we have to have accountability. And that accountability has to uh, be at every level, from the students being accountable to the teachers, the principals, all the way up to superintendents and schools. School boards. You know, Michelle, I was speaking earlier today to Craig Barrett, the former head of Intel, who's devoted sure. much of his life uh, lately to, uh, to schools and education. He made exactly the same point you just did on accountability. Yeah. Is, it, is it not just accountability of the teachers and administrators uh, all the way up to the superintendents of schools, but is it accountability also for students? In other words, do we need to be tougher with students uh, more demanding of them and hold them back more if they're not making making the the grades. Well, we do have to have accountability at every level, including the students. And I think part of the challenge that we face today is that in, in American culture, we've really shifted in the last couple of decades, where now we spend a whole lot of time trying to make kids feel good about themselves, but we've lost sight of taking mm. the time that's necessary to actually make them good at things. So, you know, I always use the analogy of, of my kids. I have two daughters who play soccer. They're not so good at soccer, but if you could see their rooms right now, they have trophies and medals and ribbons. <laughs> so we've become this culture where, you know, just by showing up, you get a trophy. And I don't think that does a lot for our American competitive spirit. I think we need to teach the kids that in order to be the best, you have to work hard. Um, you know, you have to be really diligent. And I think if you look at the Asian countries that are topping the list, they definitely have a much more competitive culture where kids are expected to work a whole lot harder. Well, I was going to ask you about that, because we see in, in countries like China and India how um, much of a work work ethic the students have and their parents. And in a country like Korea, a few years ago, illiteracy rates were really high. Now the kids are super smart. So, yeah. uh, you know, sort of two questions. If we send an American kid into China or Korea for a few years, would they come out as math whizzes and science whizzes? Is it our culture or is it our uh, education method here in the U.S. that's holding things back? 
So I think that uh, America is the greatest country in the world by far. And I think that Americans um, have the ability to do something that no, no other country really does. Um, but we are, uh, we are struggling right now in terms of trying to create the kind of public education system that is going to ensure that all kids are doing well. And so if you send an average American kid into China or Korea right now, they wouldn't perform particularly well. But um, I, I have every uh, sense of confidence confidence in American kids that if we were to set up the right education environment, that our kids could absolutely outdo any kids anywhere in the globe. Well, that's a very upbeat note to end this conversation. Thank you so much, Michelle. Absolutely. Michelle Ree, former chancellor of the public school system in Washington, D.C. And coming up, why it may be more important than ever for the book publishing industry to have a bestseller this holiday season. Remember Dennis Kozlowski? He's the former CEO of Tyco, convicted in a $134 million corporate fraud case about a decade ago. He's famous for, among other excesses, buying a $6,000 shower curtain with company money. After serving the minimum eight and a third years in New York State prison for grand larceny and conspiracy and other charges, he was granted parole today. He is scheduled to be released on January 17th. And finally tonight, the publishing industry is banking on a hit this holiday season. Command Authority is the final work from the late author Tom Clancy. The book hit store shelves and e-tailers today, but will it be enough to give the struggling industry the blockbuster it desperately needs? Julia Borston joins us with the story. The book industry is in trouble. In the first half of the year, physical book sales fell more than 7%, and even digital book sales, expected to be publishing savior, declined 5%. Last holiday season accounted for about 20% of annual sales. So this holiday season, the pressure is on. Like all retail businesses, it's critically important for authors, publishers, booksellers. I think it's especially important for the physical booksellers. Oh, it's very important. I would say the period between Thanksgiving and Christmas is our busiest time of year. We give books. The challenge we have is that most everybody has Kindles now and it's, so it's gift cards for, for whatever books. Last year was one of the biggest ever for book sales, thanks to breakout hits, the Hunger Games and Fifty Shades of Grey trilogies, accounting for about one in every 20 books sold. This year, it's a different story. There are no big breakouts. That's the problem, or, or that's the promise, depending upon which side of the coin you're sitting on. The big question is whether new releases like Tom Clancy's final book, Command Authority, hitting shelves today, will help compensate for the lack of any dominating franchises. There's fabulous new fiction this year. It's an incredible list for fall. And our sales are up right now, and I think that's due to just the great books that are out there, despite not having a, a popular series. In addition to Clancy's highly anticipated release, John Grisham, Stephen King, and Dan Brown's new titles are expected to top the charts. Plus, there are some quirky new books, like Rush Limbaugh's kids' book, Rush Revere and the Brave Pilgrims, and J.J. Abrams' conceptual novel, S, plus books from the successful Duck Dynasty TV franchise. We usually do a couple books for the holidays. During the holidays, it's just, it's like Christmas. It's just like a kid, I'm like a kid in a candy store. Another wild card, how the explosion of ebooks and tablets and the ability to instantly download books will help publishers. It certainly makes it easier for people to pick up books that they've heard about because you get delivery so quickly. But when it comes to holiday book sales, consumers often want to buy something they can wrap up and put underneath the tree, keeping bookstores like this one in business. For Nightly Business Report, Julia Borston, Los Angeles. Are you going to get command authority? Probably not. It's probably a fast read. Good for the beach. <laughs> Good for the beach. <laughs> That's not the business report for tonight. I'm Susie Garib. And we want to remind you, this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support to make programs like ours possible. And I'm Tyler Matheson. On behalf of your public TV station, thank you so much for your support. We'll hope to see you right back here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you in part by... 
TheStreet.com, up-to-the-minute stock market news and in-depth analysis. Our quant rating service provides objective, independent ratings daily on over 4,300 stocks. Learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. I'm Susie Garrett with the Nightly Business Report News Brief. Sales of new cars and trucks revved up to a seven-year high in November. Chrysler sales rose 16 percent, General Motors by 14 percent, and Ford sales surged 7 percent. On Wall Street, stocks fell for a third straight session on growing concerns that the Federal Reserve may begin tapering its stimulus plans sooner than expected. The Dow fell 94 points, closing below the 16,000 level. The Nasdaq lost 8, and the S&P fell 5 points, ending below the 1800 mark. And a federal judge declared Detroit may proceed with its bankruptcy filing, clearing the way for sweeping changes to contracts and pension payouts to city workers and retirees, as well as potentially massive losses for the city's bondholders. Be sure to tune into Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.